It is always a, a privilege and an honor to bring the Word of God to bear to our hearts, to you every, every Sunday morning, and to see the interaction that takes place in this body. It is absolutely beautiful, and we are always, all the elders and pastors here are overwhelmed by your kindness and love for one another and for us. You guys make it a delight to serve with. And so with that, I want us to take our Bibles this morning, if you would, um, and turn with me to John chapter 20, continuing where Nate read and starting in verse 24. I want to look at the idea of doubt, what plagues almost every man and every woman. John chapter 20. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was, w- was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my fingers into the hands of the imprints of the nails and, and put my hand into his side... I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your fingers and see my hands, and reach here your hands and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Here is a missional statement of the Gospel of John. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Father, you loved us with an everlasting love. You've given us the life of your Son to atone for guilty sinners and to purchase ashamed sinners and to die for enemies. And you've turned sinners, guilty men and women, and you've turned shameful people into sons and daughters. And you made them saints. What an incredible love. We thank you for it, Lord. And Father, sometimes due to our own sinfulness and due to our own humanity, we doubt, we doubt. We become faithless and we cry out with a father, I believe, help my unbelief. And so, Lord, I pray that you would come and meet us in a special way, Lord, this morning. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. In 1995, Christmas Eve, coming back from Christmas Eve dinner, right at the corner of Wadsworth Boulevard and Bellevue, 
I confess to my wife, I'm not sure this Bible is true. I'm not sure everything we've been involved with is true. My life inwardly was unraveling. Meanwhile, I was teaching an apologetic class and leading Bible studies. And um, two weeks, spent two weeks wrestling and begging God. He broke, he kept breaking my pride and showing him my pride. And for two weeks, I begged for mercy. And what brought me back is the anchor that of the, en- the empty tomb. What will I do with Christ? What will I do with Christ? And that kept bringing me back. There is a history there that I can't deny. I can't deny. Two weeks went by. The Lord came. The Lord came and visited my heart in a very, very special way. And I, and, and I tell some of my friends, I think I got saved. I think I got saved. And so doubt, we go through doubt. And when we come out of it, we're in such a better place. And it's the Lord's doing. Doubt is described as sometimes being mental. Sometimes it is emotional. Sometimes it is, most times it is spiritual. It's in the heart. It's in the emotions. It's in the mind. And, and no one likes doubt. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, I'd like to spend the day in doubt. And if you do that, we need to talk, okay, if you do that. There'll be two elders here after the service. Please come up, okay? But nobody likes doubt because at the center and the heart of doubt is uncertainty, wavering. You're not sure. Do I really believe this? Is he who... He really says he is. When certainty gives away to uncertainty, living with the unknown, when the grounding seems shaking beneath you. I don't know how many of us have gone, have had vertigo. It's like, I've had vertigo. It's like spiritual vertigo. Everything is just spinning out of order around you. And here is why. And here is why. Doubt is part of the human nature. We must all travel through its corridors and through its valleys. Imperfect knowledge, imperfect people. The Bible describes us as jars of clay, not jars of steel or metal or silver or gold, but jars of clay where we're fragile, we're feeble, we're feeble. And this morning, we're going to travel for a week. We're going to go into the room of where the disciples were and travel this week with Thomas, the apostle. We know him as Doubting Thomas. Someone said, every human is born with a question mark in their heart. There is this uncertainty. There is this uncertainty. The disciples, there's an amazing verse, not until, I've never noticed it before, in Matthew 28, 17. One verse before the Great Commission. Listen to this. They, when they saw him, speaking of the disciple after the resurrection, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Some were doubtful. These men journeyed with Christ for three years. They were discipled by Christ. They ministered with Christ. They laughed with Him. They they wept with Him. They served bread and fish to thousands of people, and yet doubt plagued their heart. The best of men are men with frailty and doubt. But the good news is we know where to go. 
And the better news is we know who will come to us in those dark days and dark hours. So this morning, I want to deal with the sin or the, the idea of doubt and disbelief or unbelief and how do we help each other How do we help one another when one of us is doubtful? And how do we better minister to our own heart? So as we journey together, I think, and we look at the life of Thomas for a moment here, I think Thomas gets a bad rap being called Doubting Thomas because at one point all the disciples were doubting and were in disbelief. So what I'd like to do is set the context what Nate read for us this morning. John chapter 20 in verse 1, you have the first eyewitness, the empty tomb, Mary Magdalene seeing the empty tomb. She ran and told both Peter and John. So Peter and John run out and come and witness this empty tomb. They become the second eyewitnesses. And they step into the tomb and it says one of them but they looked at the empty tomb and believed. Then in John chapter 20, verse 11 through 18, Mary Magdalene again becomes the first eyewitness, and this time it's not the empty tomb, it's the risen Christ. In verses 14 through 17, she saw him, she spoke to him, she touched him, and she solicited, she solicited that phrase, stop clinging to me. So they were true eyewitnesses of the risen Christ. And she becomes the first eyewitness. In verse 18, she comes announcing, I've seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. And so this is the first testimony. Goes out from Mary Magdalene, a woman to all the disciples. And in John 20, verses 19 through 23, the Lord appears to the disciples and they become all eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And starting in verses 19 through 20, read with me here. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, that would have been Sunday evening. And when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews, this was a secretive meeting. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when they had said, when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his feet. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. I love, I love biblical drama. I love, and there is so much biblical drama here. The last time they were together in John 15, 16, and 17. He said to them, Now, but now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Therefore, you too have grief now. And they had it. But I will see you again. In other words, guys, Sunday is on the way. Your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. And in John 20, 20, they begin to see clearly. The joy returns to them. The joy returns to them. What a night. Going from sorrow, going from fear, going from doubt, going from unbelief, the excitement that would have been in that room, the joy that would have been in that room, the the, electrifying emotions that would have been in that room. If walls can speak, what would they have said? It is, it is amazing to go from, from the depth of despair to joy settling in at the appearance of Christ. It is amazing. Can you, I sat and as, as I was working my way through this, I asked the question, what would, if when Christ left, what would they have been saying to each other? What would they have said to one another? They've sat there dumbfounded. One man would have said, guys, 
He's risen. He's risen. And another man would have maybe said, He's risen indeed. He's risen indeed. Would have Mary jumped up and said, I told you guys. We'd listen to a woman. But the beauty of this, the beauty of this, but with all the excitement, all the questioning lifted, the doubt lifted, they are so clear and they are so certain about the Lord. But there was one man that was missing. We'll call him first, absent Thomas. Verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, which means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. We get this idea about Thomas. He is mentioned three times in the Bible, in John chapter 11 and in John chapter 14. And it was the apostle Thomas who solicited the, the, the saying, the most famous saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. It was said to Thomas out of the Lord. But he is a realist. He is loyal. He is committed. At one point, he said, let's go and die with the Lord. This is Thomas. But Thomas was missing. But Thomas, the way John writes this, is very telling. When John says, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them. And I don't want to press this too far, but it almost seemed like Thomas should have been there. Thomas belonged with them. Thomas belonged to them. But Thomas wasn't there. This was the community of believers. This is the first Sunday service they would have had. Thomas wasn't there. The qualification of an apostle to be an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Something didn't seem right. Where was Thomas? Was he busy? Was he in fear? Did he have something more important to do? Was he disappointed? Was he hurt? Was the, was the crucifixion too much for him to bear? Where was Thomas? And men have used this passage to lay all kind of guilt trip on people. But the question is, whatever Thomas was doing, was it more important than witnessing Jesus Christ? Was it more important? There is a point of application here is that The Lord seems to come right to the community where the church is gathered. The Lord seems to be right. The the groom seems to be right where the bride is. And he loves her and he loves her presence and he loves to be with her. And so Christ appears right to the community. As a matter of fact, Luke 24, 33, with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, And they got up that very hour when they figured out who was at their presence and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord was really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. All the believers, all the eyewitnesses were gathered together. And there was this electrifying excitement in their midst. And absent Thomas missed it all. If he had been living in his doubt up to this point, he definitely lived in his doubt throughout that night, all alone by himself. That doubt could have lifted up that night. Second leads us, look at verse 25, doubting absent Thomas and then the care of the community. Verse 25, so the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. The the consistent encouragement and the care of the community. These were brothers, they lived together, they ministered together. 
What a beautiful picture. And, 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 and the Greek here is literally, they, it's, it's in the imperfect, and they kept saying to him, and they kept saying to him, we've seen the Lord, Thomas. We've seen the Lord, Thomas. And they kept doing this over and over and over. Jude 22 says this, and have mercy on some who are doubting. And so they were not just contending for the faith, but they were contending for his faith, struggling and agonizing with him. Thomas, we've seen the Lord. These were long beloved friends, and they were encouraging him. Verse 25b, their testimony will not carry. Notice, his, notice this, doubt just grips Thomas, this unbelief. But he said to them, unless, unless I see in his hands the imprints of the nails. By the way, uh, nails in the gospel are only mentioned right here in reference to Thomas. Only place in the gospels. And he says, unless I see the imprints of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. How gross and how crass unbelief becomes. Who would want to put their fingers in the wound? How do you help? How do you help someone like that? This is going to be our application for this morning. How do you help someone gripped with unbelief, gripped in doubt? How do you help contend for their faith? How do you struggle and be patient with them? Piper gives three suggestions, wrote a, a little paper on helping when someone is going through doubt. Number one, he says, and this is very applicable, don't be offended. First thing, don't be offended. Whatever you say to them, they will minimize it. They will minimize it. They will say some crazy things. Don't be offended. Don't be surprised what comes out of their mouth. Don't sign them off. Don't make them feel like a second-class Christian. Don't be offended. Hang in there with them. Love them. Suffer long with them. Second, keep listening to them. Listen to them. Give them time to work through it. Endure with patience. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 says, patiently enduring evil. Patiently enduring evil, what comes out of them. When doubt sets in, it breeds unbelief, uncertainty. You lose all your spiritual grounding. You feel weak. You listen to them. Job went through it. Jeremiah went through it. John the Baptist went through it. Some of the greatest men have gone through it. Listen to them. Endure with them. And finally... Always end with hope. Always end with hope. Don't let them have the last word. Don't let them have the words of despair and hopelessness. Leave them with hope. Encourage them. Bring the greater context. Bring the gospel into their lives. They're disoriented. They're not sure of things. There's a great illustration. I've been going through a book with my three nieces. I've got three nieces, and they're all my favorite. <laughs> Saturday mornings, we go to Starbucks, and we go through a few of those chapters. And in this book, it's, it's, it's by Scott McKnight. And there's a story of a pastor by the name of Josh Ross in Memphis, and he gives this this is a great illustration for us. Let me try to read this story for us with dry eyes. A text that Jenny sent to her parents on February 3rd, 2010, informed them that her temperature had spiked to 105. 
The next morning, Jenny, a mother and a wife, was in ICU with a group A strep. By the time she had reached the emergency room, she was in full-blown battle with septic shock. Josh flew to Dallas, where the doctor told him there is 50-50 chance. All Josh could do was stand by his sister's bed and cry and pray. In fact, praying movement was ignited. Josh recorded his biggest question from that day. Why should a husband lose his wife? And why should my nine-year-old niece live the rest of her life without her mom? Jenny's infection required that a drastic measure be taken in an attempt to save her life. We thought the day they amputated her legs was the worst day of all. Josh continues, The struggle lasted for 18 days. We had been told that there was one in 500,000 chance that sepsis would go to her brain. Well, on February 22, 2010, we received the news that it had happened. Sepsis to the brain means death. After my brother-in-law removed the lock of Jenny's hair, my family was excused from the room. A doctor sang the ancient hymn, It Is Well. David lost his wife. Malia lost her mom. My parents lost their only daughter. Jonathan and I lost our sister. The world lost a friend and a devout follower of Jesus. But Josh did not end the story there. He wrote about how the family faced death. My dad tells the story of walking out of the hospital with my mom, knowing that at the age of 53 and 52, they had lived their out. They had outlived their oldest child. They approached the sliding glass door, leading not just to the parking lot, but to a life they had never known before. There would be a normal, there would not be a normal anymore. They each walked with a limb because the lifelong journey of grief was setting in. This is what I want us to get. My mom looked at my dad and said, Remind me what we believe. What do we believe? A few minutes, my dad responded with these words. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. These are not the words of doubt and defeat, but of hope and faith. What I love about the husband and the dad is by declaring the tomb is empty, he preached the resurrection for his wife and to his own heart. He helped his wife look beyond the grave by looking at the empty tomb. That's what we do in the midst of doubt. We look beyond Hopelessness doesn't get the last word. Back to Thomas. Thomas seems to ground his reality and his certainty in the sight and touch and feel. Maybe, maybe Thomas wanted an experience like the rest. Listen to his tone. I won't believe unless I feel. I won't believe unless I see, and I don't believe unless I touch. There's almost this double negative. I won't. I won't. It, he becomes self-binding and self-blinding. He starts to set up his own demands and his own stipulations. The eyes of his head are taking precedent over the eyes of his faith. Judas saw with his eyes. He saw the miracles. He saw Christ walking on the water. He saw the signs and wonder. He saw the dead being raised. But he committed a spiritual suicide of disbelief and unbelief. John Calvin, speaking of the Thomas-like, says, 
They hinder themselves of their own accord when, they, when the way of faith is open to them. Thomas had succumbed to what we call the sensual judgment. Sensual judgment. What did Thomas see on that day? A dead corpse? A mutilated body? What devastated Thomas? Was it the dreams that he projected ministry in his life? Did he dream of a better life? Here is the reality. Christ is risen. And Thomas had the eyewitnesses. And Thomas had the testimonies. And he refused to listen to them. Because he set up his own senses to be the judgment. And I think we do that a lot. The universe seemed to collapse on Thomas. And it should. You're, when you're living this way, you're living in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men to be pitied. Our preaching is in vain. Even our faith is in vain. And we are still in sin. And sin breeds unbelief, disillusionment, and despair. Thomas feels the aloneness of it all. He seems to be singled out out of the whole church. Between verse 25 and 26, eight days lap. Could have been eight weeks, could have been eight months, could have been eight years. Some of us could live in those. Eight days. Verse 26, after eight days, his, dis his disciples were again, verse 26, Inside, a week later, exactly, Sunday to Sunday. This would have been the second Sunday they're gathered together. It seems like the new norm at this point. Absent Thomas, caring community, the disciple gripped with fear or with unbelief. Thomas keeps in the means of grace. I love this about Thomas at this point. Baby steps, if you will. Thomas doesn't just leave and go out and just does this lone ranger thing, lives on an island on his own. They don't love me. They don't like me. They don't care for me. Thomas comes back with the believers. While in the claws of, depth, of, of doubt and unbelief, Thomas returns. The need for the community. Corey Tamboom makes this beautiful illustration. She says, when a train goes through a tunnel and gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. And Thomas is doing that. One of the most spiritual things we could do. One of the most spiritual things we could do. A Friday morning, about three and a half years ago, Rodney, Robert, Brian and myself and John Collins, we would meet at Starbucks. We'd laugh together. We'd cry together. We'd help one another. And this one Friday morning, John Collins walked in and said, I did not want to be here. I need you guys. I did not feel like being here. That is the most mature thing you could do. That is the most mature thing you could do. We took him in, loved him, encouraged one another. It was such a beautiful thing when, when the body, when the body comes together. So Thomas did not abandon the community. Verse 26b, I love this phrase, Jesus came. Jesus came the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Christ seems to always show up in the community again on Sunday. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hands and put it in my side. 
Even in the context of the community, Christ seemed to come personally. Christ met Thomas personally, even in the context of the community. He addresses him personally. And Christ seems to come in the spirit of gentleness and, 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 and condescension. He doesn't frown at him, doesn't say, what's wrong with you? Doesn't scold him. And, and notice, for every demand that Thomas had, Christ had a command. Every demand, Christ commanded him. Reach here. See my hands. Reach here. Put it into my side. How did Christ know? He knows. He knows. He knows. I was walking two weeks ago. I love to walk when the sun is coming up. I watched this dad help his little daughter ride the bike. And she's wobbling all over the place. And he's, he's holding her seat and he's running behind her. And in all her wobbling, he had her. We might, in our doubt, we may never be able, we like to trace, we may never be able to trace the hand of God. Surely we trust his heart. And we wobble, and we wobble, and we'll go to heaven wobbling. I've come to terms with that. It's never going to be perfect. What Thomas was invited to do was not some set of apologetics. As a matter of fact, there is no indication biblically Thomas reached out his hand. He was invited to be shown a broken body. He was invited to be shown a bleeding Savior who is Lord. I love, I love the King James Version. Listen to this. It's so endearing. In verse 27, he says, And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And you know, that's today we, are, we will celebrate the Lord's table, and that's what we do every month here. We celebrate the Lord's table, and we remember. We remember the broken body. We remember the shed blood. And it's, it's broken for my sins. And it's shed for my guilt. James Boyce says it was the Christ of the cross who reached Thomas. Nothing like the love that melts the hardest heart, heals the broken heart, answers the question of a confused heart. So Thomas was invited to come and to, and to touch a broken body, a broken body. Here comes the main command of the whole passage, verse 27b. Here is the main verb, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Stop being faithless. Stop being faithless, Thomas, and be believing. Christ, in a very gentle rebuke, does not scold him for his unbelief, but invited him and received him. Unbelief, unbelief will never stay neutral. Unbelief will become hardened, cold, callous, and faithless. And Jesus is stopping that for Thomas. And faith grows faithful, restful, trusting, peaceful with joy. And somewhere between verses 27 and 28, with one look and with one command, light of the world dawned on the heart, in the heart of Thomas, the light of the world. 2 Corinthians 4 says, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. 
which leads us to the fifth thing is the confession. The confession. Verse 28, from the lowest point of a skeptic doubter to the highest confession found in the Gospel of John. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. There, 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 there is so much there. Let me bring out three implications. Three implications. Number one, one of the greatest repentance led to one of the greatest apostolic confession on the deity of Christ. The, the, the tender compassion co- coupled with divine knowledge led and enabled Thomas to rise to the highest view of the Lord given by the, by the gospel of John. This confession has become the climactic goal of the gospel of John. This is what John wanted to see taking place in the heart of every man. He wanted to see doctrine and theology become such a reality in our hearts that we could cry out and say, my Lord and my God. Second implication. When Thomas said and confessed, my Lord and my God, notice the double possessive personal pronouns. Not just divine and deity, my Lord, my God. And when he said, my Lord, he placed Christ on the throne of his heart to rule his life and to reign in his life. And when he said, my God, he placed Christ on the throne of his universe. One man put it this way. He said, we thank God, we owe it to Thomas, to this disbelieving disciple for what the Lord did with his disbelief, converting it into complete faith. Complete faith. The one, the one who was lording over the Lord his demands has become the servant, and he has become the submissive one. That's the gospel in the heart. Story doesn't end there. Church history tells us Thomas in 52 AD went to India, was speared to death, so the confession became a faithful witness, was speared to death. 2006, a census was taken in India there's at least, at least 28 million Christians call people, call themselves Christian because the my Lord and my God went to India in the southern part. And people are still dying for their faith as faithful witness. What Thomas, the Lord used in Thomas to ignite southern India. I met a man just this week Indian, his middle name is Thomas. His middle name is Thomas. The climax climax of John's gospel, where John brings Thomas' faith in act. So here is the storyline, and this is where we we come in. Hang with me a few more minutes. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, Thomas, because you have seen me, have you believed? The trouble with Thomas is not that because he saw, he now believes. Jesus does not rebuke him for that. The trouble with Thomas, and I think with all of us today, I think is that he spurned the testimony and the eyewitnesses of others and demanded more for his own self. Unless I see, unless I feel, unless I touch, unless I experience, I won't believe. And that's what Thomas was doing. And the Lord, what he's doing in Thomas's story is he's bridging and you bridging faith from the gospel time to the new era that will come. In other words, the days of eyewitnesses are coming to a close and a new era begins. And he begins with this, blessed, Thomas, blessed are they 
who did not see and yet believe. That's us. That's the storyline. That's where we come in. Blessed are they who do not see but believe. Os Guinness says, faith does not feed on thin air, but on facts. Its instinct is its roots. It roots itself in truth, to earth itself in reality, and it is this which distinguishes faith from fantasy. This is always the way. This type of doubt is silenced by facts, answered by truth, and reassured by understanding. Truth is the only sufficient answer faith can give doubt. For it is the truth of the matter, the fact of the case, which gives faith its solid foundation. What Osganes is saying is right here. Peter picks up on this and he says, Although you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe, you believe in him and you greatly rejoice. Joy inexpressible and full of glory. The best way, the best way to doubt your doubts is to bring them right to the word. By faith, the best way we could do this. And to give a testimony. To give a testimony. Let me end with a story. This is one of those that gripped my heart in the last two months. And I think it's a good challenge for us in the comfortable world in the West. In his book, The Insanity of God, Nick Ripken tells the story of a man by the name of Stoyan, which means stand firm. It is a common Eastern European name. Stoyan tells the story of his parents when he was 12 years old after World War II, when the communists consolidated their power through his country. He was 12 years old when they imprisoned his father, who was a Protestant pastor, for 10 years while being held in a secret place in their own town. Every morning, one of the guards would take some of his human waste and spread it on a piece of toast and brings it to my father for breakfast. The impact and the persecution left such an emotional, psychological scars Nine discouraging months went by, no news of my dad. Stoyan and his mother finally got to see his dad. He said, and together we walked up to a table where only only because of a piercing blue eye staring out to me from the rags did I recognize a skeletal figure, a man as my father. I took my father's hand in mine and I put my face close to his and I whispered, Papa, I am so proud of you. I was 13 years old. Then he was sent to a labor camp in the, to the gulag outside the city for the rest of the 10 years. Near the end, one of the last cruel attempts to break him, they informed him that he was scheduled for execution. They took him outside, tied him to a pole, and offered him one last opportunity to deny Christ. He strengthened his back and stood tall and declared, I will not deny Christ. They continued to insult him and curse him. And instead of taking him back to his cell, they untied him, took him to the prison wall, unlocked the gate, and to his surprise, they literally threw him out. He walked and then to the church where he found everyone and his family was reunited. Several months later, he returned as a minister, as a pastor of a church. An old lady walked in and asked for his help. Her son had gone blind to provide and to administer ointment to his eyes. And he went with her. And as he walked in the room, he got the shock of his life. The man who was laying there was the same prison guard who would for nine months Bring him the toast with his human waist spread on it. Stoyan, the son, 
older in age, looked at, looked at Nick, who was interviewing him, and he said, and he poked him on the chest in a prophet-like voice. And he said this to him. He said, don't ever give up in freedom what we would never have given up in persecution. That is our witness to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't give that up in your freedom. Don't give that up. Great, great story from the Gulag, Eastern Europe for us. Brothers and sisters, the resurrection is powerful. The resurrection of Christ is powerful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the testimony of a father and a mother limping in the midst of tragedy, and yet in their limp, they're looking to an empty tomb. We thank you for a man who would not give up his freedom. He would not give up any of this for the sake of being a witness for Jesus Christ's resurrection. And we thank you for Thomas who confessed, my Lord, my God, and that had become such a reality. He would die. He would die. He would lose his life for that confession. And we thank you for everyone here that has gone through trials and through tragedies, wobbling, wobbling through it, and yet our hope and our eyes are fixed on the one. Thank you. Blessed, blessed be your name, Lord.